All right, so the next concept, the other concept from this week was electric field. field, but that's used up for force, so we have to use E for electric field. Do you know whether the electric field is a vector or a scalar? Yeah, if you just memorize this as a vector. So in the textbook, this might be written with arrows on top of it, but usually on the blackboard, we'll leave out the arrows. All right, well, you mentioned when we began that you were having less intuition for these concepts. Well, this is where I think students start to lose intuition, especially for electric fields. Yeah. We'll, we'll try to make this more intuitive. Can I ask you a yeah. question? What are the units for electric field? Are there any? That's a great question. Yes, okay. absolutely. Well, that was the very next thing we were going to talk about, okay. because I believe that one of the keys to getting intuition for this concept is knowing the units. So it's good that, you, that you're thinking about that. It is crucial to memorize the units here. The units for electric field are newtons per coulomb. Okay. The units for the electric field are newtons per coulomb. This is a vector. Okay, so um, what's going on here? Well, done so far. We've talked about how you can focus on a charge and figure out what the force is that, that the first charge is exerting on the second charge using this formula. And of course, charge two is also exerting a force on charge one, but in this particular diagram I've only shown one of the forces. Now we're going to think about this in a different way. We're going to think about this in a different way by introducing a middleman. We're no longer going to think of Q1 directly exerting a force on Q2. Instead, another way to think about this is that Q1 is going to create an electric field in space. And then the electric field exerts the force. This is just a different way of thinking about the same phenomenon that turns out to often be more useful. Instead of thinking of one charge directly exerting a force on another charge, now we're going to think of another useful way of thinking about that. Now we're going to suppose that one charge exert, uh, creates a field in space, and that field exerts the force on charge two. Now again, you could also say that charge two is creating a field that exerts a force on charge one. But to keep things simple, we're just going to look at it in one direction. So you can see why we might think of the electric field as the middleman. Both of these are correct ways to think about what's happening, but in many cases, this will be more useful. Up here is the way we've been thinking about things so far, but now we're going to start thinking about this approach. Now we're going to change the names in this approach. Up here, we call these charge one and charge two, but names are arbitrary. We can call these whatever we want. If we wanted to, we could call this charge Bob and charge Carol. Mm -hmm. Well, the more useful names here are, we can call this the source charge. When we use the electric field approach, we call this charge the source charge. And it's pretty clear why that is, because it's the source of this electric field. And there's not really a great name for this, but sometimes this is called the test charge. So that's the name I'm going to use, for lack of a better name. And the symbol for the test charge is Q sub 0, or Q sub naught. So Q sub s is the source charge. It's creating the electric field. And Q sub naught is the test charge, which is feeling the force from the electric field. Now remember, if we wanted to, we could have thought of this as the source that's creating an electric field that's exerting a force on this. It's just a matter of who you're focusing on. But we decided to focus on this as the source. 
So the source is the one that's creating the electric field that you're focusing on, and the test charge is the one that's feeling the force that you're focusing on. And the key thing is, if you know the electric field, that makes it easy to figure out the force on any charge. Electric fields are convenient because they make it easy to figure out the force on any charge. And if you know the units, it makes it clear why that's so easy. Um, let's say then that uh, we've got a uh, electric field of positive three newtons per coulomb. Well, first of all, we want to understand what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, last term, I think we learned how to interpret ratios of units. Do you remember the trick we saw last term of putting a one down in the denominator? Uh, and then we would say what this tells us is if we have a one coulomb test charge, it will feel a force of three newtons. That's the meaning of this electric field. This tells us that if we have a one coulomb test charge, it will feel a three newton force. Now, the electric field is also supposed, to, also supposed to tell you the direction of the force. Uh, and we'll just learn how to do that. Um, for a positive test charge, the field and the force are in the same direction. test charge, the field and the force are in the same direction. If you have a negative test charge, the direction of the field is opposite to the direction of the well, force. Direction. Yeah, sorry. Direction of the field is opposite to the direction of the force. Okay, thank you. By the way, what we're writing down here is we're going to try to make a float chart that you can refer to throughout the, uh, the course. So maybe later you might want to put this on a separate piece of paper so it doesn't get lost. So we'll just memorize that by definition, when you have a positive test charge, the field and the force are in the same direction. And when you have a negative test charge, the field and the force are in opposite directions. So let's say we have a positive 3 coulomb test charge, and it's in an electric field of 3 newtons per coulomb. What would be the force on this? What would be the magnitude of the force? Let me actually, actually, let's try this start. One coulomb, I meant to say. If you have a one coulomb charge, what would be the force that it feels? Uh, three newtons? Yeah, we already saw that was how to interpret this. A one coulomb charge would feel three newtons of force. And let's say that this is to the left. If the field is to the left and we have a positive test charge, what direction would the force be in? To the left. Using this. For a positive charge, the field and the force are in the same direction. How can we work this out mathematically? Well, mathematically, we would say we've got 3 newtons per 1 coulomb, and we've got a 1 coulomb charge. So the coulombs cancel, and we end up with 3 newtons. That should be obvious enough without actually working out the math. Let's say we have a 2 coulomb charge. What would the force on that be? Uh, 6 newtons. And the direction would be? still the same direction as here, because we still have a positive charge. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we should be able to do this without any math. If one coulomb would have three newtons of force, then if you add another coulomb, that should add another three newtons of force mm -hmm. for six newtons. Or we can work with the units. The field is three newtons per one coulomb, and now we're putting in two coulombs. So the coulombs cancel, and we get three times two, which is six newtons. Mm -hmm. would the force be here? Uh, nine. And the, 
direction. So we're trying to get more intuition for what this means. This means every time you add an extra coulomb of test charge, you get three extra newtons of force. That's what this is telling us. We've added another extra coulomb, so we have another three newtons of force. We can work that out mathematically. Three newtons per coulomb times three coulombs is nine newtons. How about if we had a positive 10 Coulomb charge? Uh, 30 newtons to the left. That's right. If one Coulomb gets 3 newtons, if you have 10 times as much charge, you should get 10 times as much force. Or mathematically, 3 newtons per Coulomb times 10 Coulombs is 30 newtons. Mm -hmm. 